And now introducing Chris Fallon. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, so Peter has told me that I am the last thing standing between you and a glass of wine. Um, so I will try and make this brief and exciting, something that uh, academics are not necessarily always known for. Um, as my affiliation indicates, I'm a, an assistant professor in the cinema and digital media program at UC Davis. Uh, like many media programs, CDM tries to give our students both practical hands-on experience using digital tools to tell small stories, uh, but then also sort of give them a background in critically thinking and historically interrogating those tools. Uh, so you can think of this talk as sort of the history and theory of many of the tools that we've spent the day talking about. Um, I should also start by confessing that I have a certain anxiety about bringing the topic of metadata to an event that has at least traditionally been about books and technology, because it's in those two fields that metadata sort of finds its roots. Um, in essence, it's both old and new. Uh, the term itself, metadata, which we commonly sort of define as information about other forms of information, uh, first appeared in a computer science textbook by Philip Bagley in 1967 called The Extension of Programming Language Concepts. And this is an actual scan of the book, so long before O'Reilly Media and its cute animals, uh, computer science books were often published with this sort of zero degree mentality where all one needed was a typewriter and a Xerox machine. Um, something that Bagley definitely took over, even though his work was sponsored by the Air Force Office of Research and published by the National Bureau of Standards. So on one hand, metadata wants to be this sort of standardizing open gesture. On the other hand, uh, that relates very much to digital contexts, uh, like the sort of data intensive computing environment that Bagley was working to overcome problems in. On the other hand, uh, that move to encapsulate and categorize pieces of information inside of other pieces of information, of course, has a much longer history in uh, systems like the Dewey Decimal System and the Library of Congress catalog information. Um, here we get to see at work some of the sort of interesting slippage that metadata poses to the media that they describe. On the one hand, they want to be sort of marginal, that is minor helpmates to something that we would deem much more important. You wouldn't take, uh, say, the call number on a book and knowing that piece of information as being more important to the information that was actually contained between the covers of the book itself. And yet, in a sufficiently sort of information-dense environment like a library, uh, if you don't have that call number, you're not gonna find what you need, right? Um, so metadata in this sense are both marginal and yet central. And in fact, if we were gonna tell the story of metadata in relation to media, we would say that it's one of transition between the marginal and the central. Uh, to see two quick examples of how this is so in contexts outside of media, uh, the whistleblower Edward Snowden brought everybody's attention to a program that was run by the government uh, secretly under the auspices of the NSA collecting telephonic metadata about every call that was placed in the United States on one of the major carriers. Uh, so this was essentially information about who called who and when using any sort of uh, communication method. Uh, the government justified its move by saying, you know, don't worry, we weren't recording the content of your calls, it was just the metadata around it. Uh, but as privacy experts were quick to point out, if I know enough about what you're doing, that is who you're talking to, where you're going, who you're contacting, in essence, your social graph, then I can begin to make pretty educated guesses about your motivations and actions. Um, a, a second example, of course, is the social security number. So the social security number started out as a non-descriptive piece of information that was tagged with every taxpayer in the United States. Uh, and it seemed to be uh, something ancillary that you, know, you wouldn't need to know unless you were accessing that particular record, right? but as a shorthand signifier that came to stand in for people's identity as a passcode in some sense, it obviously took on a life of its own as it made its way into any number of other sort of financial contexts. So now, uh, instead of being this obscure piece of non-descriptive information, 
it seems to exchange almost one-to-one -one for one's identity, at least as it represents itself in things like bank accounts, mortgages, and all of these other places in which it's popped up. Again, the move from the marginal to the central. So in relation to media, uh, specifically in relation to photographic media, uh, things like still images and moving images, which is what I work on, uh, what I'm always trying to coach my students on is this idea that every image that we record, indeed every photographic image in the world, has these sort of two competing gestures. They're at once subjective, that is, they tell us something about the person who's recorded them or the person who's interpreting them, the author, the artist, the person who made the piece of work, but then they're also objective. That is, they tell us something that's true about the world, right? And this varies from image to image and from observer or creator to, to observer or creator. And again and again, we can't ever locate one as being entirely objective or subjective, but it's some place in between. And this is a story with images that metadata plays a very central role in. So if we think about two very different contexts, one would be scientific publishing and the role of photographic media in relation to laboratory work. So Lorraine Bastin and Peter Gallison have described the way in which scientific images, uh, like this one, which was on the cover of Nature, have this sort of mechanical objectivity that elevates the camera to a piece of laboratory equipment, something like a thermometer or some other piece of recording uh, equipment that would uh, pull facts and data from the world, right? And metadata often appears next to these scientific images as a way to attest to that mechanical objectivity. So things like aperture, how the image was recorded, what film stock it went through, uh, the size of the negative, all of those things are faithfully put down as pieces of data so that the, the experiment can be later replicated. If we jump from science to uh, a completely different context, that is the art world, uh, in the art world, we often see this same marginal appearance of metadata about artistic images and photographs, and yet here uh, we find details like the author's name, the dates of their life, uh, the particular print material, it's uh, the title, whatever they've titled the image, and all of those things are elevating photography, which for much of its history in the art world was deemed as too mechanically objective to really achieve the status of a true subjective art to something on par with painting or some other form of objective ex expression, subjective expression. That is, it can be a tool for artistic creativity much like any other of the, of the plastic arts. Um, so we can see then that metadata plays sort of a contradictory role in relation to the media that it describes. And this is something that goes way back in its history. If we look at one of the earliest uh, iterations of metadata, we can find this technology that Kodak pioneered called the autographic. Uh, and this is sort of amazing for its time. It appeared in 1914, and it was a redesigned camera back and a specially formulated film cartridge that allowed the photographer to open up a flap on the back of the camera and record information about the image using a stylus and then expose it to the sunlight. This would later be printed in the margin of the image, as you can see here. Um, the move was kind of an interesting one for Kodak, which up until this point had marketed its technology with a sort of push-button ease and simplicity. Their motto, you push the button, we do the rest, sort of attested to the automaticity and objectivity of images. They said, look, you can automatically have a portrait that faithfully captures all of the details of how a scene or a person appeared uh, at the push of a button, right? It's, it's automatic and mechanical and objective, right? The autographic, on the other hand, stresses something insufficient about this information. It tells us that we need additional details in the image for it to fully tell its story. And Kodak significantly tagged this later part of its campaign with this new technology, going from you push the button, we do the rest, to let Kodak keep the story. And it was this idea that if we expand upon the channel of information that images offer us with some sort of ancillary metadata, then we can get something approaching a narrative, right? And it's a narrative that expands uh, both the general and the personal, the objective and the subjective that I alluded to earlier. So take this example of an autographic image. On the one hand, we can see the, 
the photograph, which gives us an image of a, an older man bending over, doing something that we can't quite tell. In the margin, we have the metadata, or the autographic annotation, Old Bill, right? So what is Old Bill telling us, or the presence of the metadata Old Bill telling us about the image itself? On the one hand, it gives us more detail than the image itself can sort of speak to. It tells us that this person's proper name is likely Bill, right? So it gives us uh, a degree of objective detail. And in addition to how things looked, what their appearance was, we get to some, uh, some sense or some understanding of who is in the image, right? On the other hand, we get something more subjective and personal than we otherwise would have had. This isn't just the proper name Bill, this is Old Bill. Uh, it's a nickname and it seems to attest to or leave some trace of a personal history between the photographer and the subject. That is, it brings out equally this need to be both more objective and precise, but also more subjective and personal in this dual gesture of recording this information. And this is something that the name autographic implies, right? It says that you can make these images more your own through your own hand, right? Um, the autographic died out uh, in the 1940s and 50s, but this move to record data alongside images uh, carried over uh, mostly in the direction of a technology called the Databack. And the Databack basically was a way of recording camera settings directly on the margin uh, of the negative in between frames. So you can see here, this is an example of uh, Nikon's multifunction line, uh, which allowed people to record things like the aperture setting, the shutter speed, and the date and time of image capture directly on that thin strip between negatives. Um, this was largely the domain of professional photographers and archivists, that is, people who were interested in finding a way to capture this information alongside images themselves so that the two wouldn't become separated. Uh, it filtered down sort of terribly into the consumer level uh, with this, uh, you can barely see it here because it's uh, sort of washed out, but uh, in, with this on image date stamp that appeared sort of throughout the early late 80s and early 90s in point and shoot cameras that would allow you to automatically digitally stamp the image with the date, thereby sort of locating an individual event which people would recognize with a specific date and time. Again, this gesture towards specificity. Metadata, as they move over into the digital realm more properly, at least in relation to images, take on this relationship that makes them both more precise and more fuzzy. Um, to see what I mean, we have to look at something like a standard, like the EXIF file format. EXIF was uh, created in 2002 by a large consortium of different camera makers, printers, scanners, and other sort of equipment manufacturers who wanted a way to make sure that the image uh, information about image capture was recorded right in the file itself and embedded in a set of categories that would offer uh, any particular screen or other device which was displaying these images uh, the way to sort of properly show them. So this included all the stuff from the data back days like aperture settings, shutter speed, etc., but also the camera model, even the serial number for the camera which was sort of controversial. Uh, and then other things that sort of push the definition of metadata into new territory. So uh, one of the fields that got included in the standard was GPS coordinates, and this proved to have all sorts of unintended consequences, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, so for example, uh, inadvertently telling everyone who can see an image where it was recorded uh, led to the capture of the software programmer turned billionaire that are at least millionaire turned fugitive, John McAfee, uh, when he posted, when he allowed the, the publication Vice to post a photo of his whereabouts, and he was later apprehended uh, based on the metadata that was embedded in the image that Vice, that Vice published. Uh, this also poses, you know, sort of dangers for individuals who might post, you know, pictures of their children or of their new belongings or something on social media channels and uh, we're sort of regularly reassured that if we don't strip the metadata, the GPS metadata out of these images, uh, that they'll come, you know, that thieves and stalkers are on their way to our house to immediately uh, steal our children or something. Um, so jumping ahead, uh, if GPS started to append where images were taken, uh, then 
camera manufacturers began pushing this technology further to use face detection and tell us who was in an image. Uh, this, like GPS information, tended to have some unintended consequences, and the technology was revealed to have more than uh, a few sort of problematic dimensions when it came to issues of race, ethnicity, and gender. Uh, it's tempting, I think, on many levels to sort of dismiss this as a technological glitch, but we should be mindful of the fact that, uh, as we've seen over and over in the history of these tools, uh, that our, our own sort of ideological preoccupations can get hard-coded into the algorithms themselves, and we shouldn't confuse sort of process with politics. Um, so if GPS gave us where, and face detection gives us who, uh, Google recently demonstrated that its computer vision algorithms are quickly becoming capable of determining what is in images as well. And here again, this all pushes metadata you know, into this territory where we can't quite determine if we're talking about its subjective or its objective pull, right? So this is a, a tool, it's a computer that's determining what is in these images and they're being categorized according to that. Uh, according to that determination, but is this a human interpretation? Is this a machine's interpretation? It's some combination of both. Mm -hmm. uh, the power that this new level of metadata gives us uh, in multiple ways to work with media to tell stories uh, can be illustrated by just a few quick examples that seem to, again, push in two directions at once. Um, on one hand, there's been a ton of academic research uh, by figures like Lev Manovich to use computer vision algorithms to determine uh, the sort of cultural relevance of selfie styles in multiple cities around the world. So Manovich collected millions of selfies off of Instagram, geolocated them into these five cities, and then tried to sort of use algorithms to determine if there were any cultural differences that might emerge. So on the one hand, he's doing sort of standard humanities work, but he's using uh, computer science technology to do it, computer science methodology. Um, just another example of how uh, metadata can be used to push the bounds of image making, uh, Alexi Efros, who's over at Berkeley now, uh, has created these amazing algorithms that mine uh, huge image databases for uh, geographically proximate images and then uses them to stitch together new images. So he'll take this image on the left, uh, figure out other images that were shot in the same proximity, and then come up with an entirely new image that's sort of stitched together that removes this house out of the scene. Uh, and to see it in action, it's, it's truly amazing. It's all sort of automatic, right? Um, if we take something like Google Earth, uh, we can see just how central metadata has gone from being a marginal sort of descriptive category over into the sort of necessary factor for the work to exist at all. Uh, on the one hand, Google Earth is, of course, a visual tool comprised, comprised of photographs that offers us a quote unquote picture of the world, right? But the way that it does this is by stitching together millions of different images using uh, a, an intensely robust framework of geolocational metadata, right? Outside of this framework, we would just have a bag of images, and it wouldn't be you know, as productive or as creative as the bag of stories that we just heard about, right? Uh, it would just be a sort of series of views of, the, and of views of the world that were sort of any view whatever, right? Within the context of the metadata, though, it provides a very sort of powerful framework to navigate and view the world in its entirety. Um, other examples of this, uh, you can, you know, just to sort of go on about Google, uh, which is both sort of the evil face and the good guy in, in every story about metadata, uh, you can sort of think about its self-stated mission to organize the world's information uh, as a way, uh, that story told differently is basically Google figuring out ways to extract or append metadata to any, sort, any number of different forms of media and then make those sort of accessible and findable to people and thereby sort of monetize them from books to videos to email to places, right? Uh, so metadata have moved in a direction that's both open and proprietary, at both at the same time. Um, again, to, to sort of pick a big media, is that five minutes left? 
Okay, uh, to pick a sort of big media example, uh, Netflix uh, sort of famously uses metadata algorithms about what we watch to determine what it, what it suggests we should watch next, and even to sort of uh, crowdsource what its viewers will wanna see and thereby fund new productions. Um, if all of these examples sort of take us uh, into the big corporate realm of storytelling, uh, I think there's a number of ways that we can look at metadata in relation to smaller individual and personal stories. Um, oh, one other example of uh, metadata being used to stitch together and present a new image of the world is of course in VR, where uh, again, uh, accelerometer and camera position are determined using metadata uh, to create a virtual immersive image that wouldn't exist on its own. Um, so just a few quick examples of individual interpretation of images and how the dis and the disruptive power of metadata in the hands of everyday users. Uh, culture critics have pointed out that the hashtag uh, is both a categorical sort of hierarchical move, but it's also an interpretive disruptive move, right? So, uh, and this is a foot in this image. Uh, tagging an image awkward, for example, is implicitly sort of commenting on the contents of the image. Uh, and protesters of hijacked the hashtag MyNYPD to use it not to show glorious examples of community policing like the NYPD hoped, but instead to, sh to document and expose police abuse, right? So again, uh, th these are sort of ground up individual uh, ways in which metadata disrupts the flow of images. The platform Snapchat, which I think in terms of telling small stories uh, gets it about as right as anyone could, uh, at this point at least, um, allows users to uh, annotate their images in really interesting ways. And I think this preserves a lot of that sort of haptic tactile dimension that the autographic first sort of gestured to over 100 years ago. Um, even something as sort of um, non-creative as Tinder, uh, which I have to confess I haven't used, but uh, I hear reports of, uh, allows us to sort of engage in this basic categorization of images by appending individual metadata via swipe left or a swipe right into liking or disliking an image, right? And so you can think about the way in which that metadata is then used to suggest other images to create sort of a profile of one's taste, right? All through the use of metadata. Uh, the artist Jim Campbell uh, famously uses metadata to sort of give averages for in this case, uh, every frame in the film Psycho. This is sort of a blue chip artist. These are works that are both, that are both hanging at this moment in the SF MoMA. Uh, and then one last example of, I think, a creative uh, use of the disruptive power of metadata uh, is the local Bay Area artist, Jenny O'Dell. Um, two projects that she's done that I think illustrate this are uh, a series of images of large scale digital prints where she went through Google Earth and pulled out Cut, cut and pasted different land features uh, from the context of Google Earth and sort of pasted them all together. So here we have 206 crop circles or uh, 100 container ships, right? And these things pull uh, pieces of data out of this sort of seamless experience that we have on Google Earth and places them in this defamiliarized context. Uh, her other project that I think works really interestingly with, with metadata is the Bureau of Suspended Objects. These are all discarded things that Odell finds in different dumps or you know, gets from different people who are throwing them away. And she engages in this exhaustive, often hours long uh, research project on each object to give us you know, uh, where it was manufactured, uh, what its lifespan was, some particular story. She'll often include coordinates to the actual factory where it was put together, images from within the factory if she can find them. Uh, and this is sort of, rather than taking metadata away, as her other project does, this is sort of investing and appending uh, these objects with the metadata that they would otherwise lack as they're sort of discarded. Um, so I'll leave you with both of those, and thank you very much for your time.